son. At least once in their lifetime, if they are physically and financially able, they are required to make that pilgrimage to Mecca to remember, to remember that in the sight of God, there's no, we're all equal. And so this is the lesson for um, humanity. As Muslims, when we refer to God, we say Allah. Now that's not a Muslim God, as, as, you, know, as you might probably hear Fox News saying. No, it is not a Muslim God. It is simply the Arabic word for God. The Quran was revealed in Arabic. And Arab Christians use the word Allah. If you open an Arabic Bible, you see the word Allah multiple times. So it is just simply the um, Arabic term for Allah. But it's also very unique because for Muslims, the term Allah, we prefer that over the, the use of the word God. Because when you say God, that has a male connotation. Because you've got God and you've got goddess, right? Mm -hmm. You take the word God, you can also pluralize it. It can become gods, right? Mm -hmm. None of that is possible with the word Allah. Allah has no gender. Allah can never be pluralized. It is a very unique word in the Arabic language. Mm -hmm. And so when we say Allah, we all know exactly what we're talking about. We are talking about a God that from the Muslim perspective, we cannot draw, we cannot create a statue of. Um, it does not look like a white European male. Um, God is beyond our description. God is neither male nor female. God is one. For Muslims, God is one. That means God does not beget, God does not, is not begotten. And so from our perspective, Muhammad, who is the prophet of Islam, is not the son of God, nor does he share divinity. And we also believe that Jesus is not the son of God. We believe he does not share divinity. These are all great prophets, like Abraham, like <laughs> Moses. You know, if being born of a virgin birth um, you know, from the Muslim perspective, that's no different than Adam and Eve that were born without a mother or father. It's from, from our perspective that it is within God's power to create as he wills. You know, from a lot of times when I'm thinking, you know, now these days we've got things like uh, um, all these different ways to create babies, so to speak, <laughs> but we still haven't had anyone try to part the sea. <laughs> you know, so, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> so, so the idea is that it is within God's realm to be able to do any of these types of things. Um, from the Muslim, also within Muslim scripture, we, have, we believe in a whole line of prophets, and we believe they all came with basically the same message. The belief in one God, being good uh, uh, representatives of God on earth, um, being kind to your neighbor, taking care of orphans, taking care of the needy, um, really promoting, promoting um, good on earth, taking care of the environment. A lot of people are surprised when we say that, you know, this whole environmentalism thing, this has been going on in the Sam for 1,400 years. It doesn't mean that all Muslims are following it. Some of them are the worst culprits when it comes to the environment, you know, particularly sometimes some of these leaders and all of these types of things. But from the Quranic perspective itself, and from the traditions of the prophet, we have hundreds and hundreds of traditions and verses that talk about taking care of the environment. In fact, we are taught that even if you live on the edge of a flowing river, you should never waste water. You should only use what you need. And we're taught that even if the day of judgment, if you hear the day of judgment coming, and you have the shoot of a plant in your hand, plant it. Even if you know the whole earth is going to be destroyed, plant it. This may be your final good deed that you did on earth. And so this is what we are taught as, um, uh, as Muslims. Five of the men that uh, um, we believe were of the prophets were given revelation or scripture. This is Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus and Muhammad, and we always say God's peace and blessings be upon uh, all of them. Um, as Muslims, we also are required to pray five times a day. 
Um, and these are interspersed throughout the day. We have, you know, early, very a pre-dawn prayer, early afternoon prayer, late afternoon prayer, evening prayer, night prayer. And people say, oh my God, is that all you guys do is pray? <laughs> but you know what? We incorporate it into our schedule. We incorporate it into our life. It's, it's a way of having that constant connection with God. It's very <clears throat> difficult to go ahead and really commit acts that would be unacceptable to God if we know that within the span of a few hours um, we have to stand before God and, and account for our actions. And so as Muslims we believe again that we were created to be God's representatives on earth and so this is the way we keep our connection with God. And when we turn to pray, unlike what they, you know, those little pamphlets that seem to be spread out everywhere I go, sometimes in by grocery stores, sometimes at universities, where they say Muslims pray to a moon god. No, but we, we don't pray to a moon god. We pray to the God of Abraham, and when we turn to pray, we turn to face Mecca. Why is that? Because we are reiterating physically, not just spiritually, that we worship the God of Abraham. And so that's wherever you are in the world, you'll turn to face Mecca for that same purpose. And actually, we have two Muslim Islamic cemeteries here in Milwaukee. And they have been bought, and, when, and they have the graves kind of like when they are set, they are set so that when the body is laid down, that their right shoulder and their face can be laid down facing Mecca. Mm -hmm. So even in death, it's a symbolic thing to show we worship the God of Abraham. Abraham and his son Ishmael that built the Kaaba so many years ago. Um, as Muslims, we are also required to uh, fast um, during the month of Ramadan. Many of you probably have heard of Ramadan, right? Mm -hmm. For my Christian friends that do Lent, that's a wimpy fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have, I have friends telling me that I gave up Starbucks. <laughs> and you know, I said, wow, that, that must have been tough. You know? um, for us, our fast is for one month. We break it every sunset, but we fast from pre-dawn until sunset, and we fast from food, from drink, from smoking, from chewing gum, from even water. So it's a very strict fast. In winter, that's not a big deal because by the time you get up and you do a few things, it's like time to break your fast. In summer, like this summer, that was tough. That's tough because you're talking about literally 16, 17 hours of straight fasting. But you know what? This is what we believe is a time of character building. It builds your character. It kind of um, uh, reminds you. It reminds you pretty much of your purpose and, and your and, and your attachment to God and how dependent you are on God. It also is a wake up call. I always say that it's kind of like the protester. You know, you go to protest, uh, um, and and I think I'm, I'm amongst people that know what protesting is. You know, um, so if you hold up a sign. You might not necessarily think that just because you're holding up a sign or protesting that it's going to really change a policy, but it's bringing attention to something. And so in our fast, it should bring attention, our attention, to those all around the world that are suffering, to those that they don't have anything to eat. And they can't always find, you know, at the end of the day, we know we're going to break our fast. We can turn on the faucet and, and drink water, and that's not a big issue for us. But there are so many others that can't do that. And so charity is really at a very high level during Ramadan. And the idea is to elevate you spiritually. And the way you are elevated spiritually is to really come to terms. Because you can go day in, day out, going through your same routine, same routine. But then for one month every year, you have to stop and you have to rethink your life and rethink what it is that you're doing. And so that's what fasting does um, uh, for us. As Muslims, we're also required to purify our wealth by giving to charity. That's called zakat. And I really love the word zakat. I don't like the word charity. Because charity gives the feeling that it's the haves giving the have-nots. Whereas zakat means purifying your wealth. It means you never really owned it. God gave this to you to be the caretaker of it. And so you put it to good use in whatever way you can. And now you have to take 
this percentage of what you were given to take care of to someone else who is now the caretaker. And so that's why you find that in, for example, you can go to many Muslim um, mosques and, and places even around the world, and it's seldom that you would find people kind of like, okay, here's our list of all our donors, you know what I mean? Um, because we're taught that your, your left hand should not even know what your right hand has given. So you give just for the sake of God. And the idea is, too, that if glory comes from the people, you know, it's like, oh, wow, you donated this room, that's pretty awesome, that, that's going to take from really the benefit that you're achieving um, spiritually and also take from what you potentially can achieve from God. And so you should be just giving really for the sake of giving because this is an important thing um, to do and this is something that, that you don't own anything because if it wasn't for God's, like, you know, like, like Christians say, Muslims have a similar saying, but for the grace of God, you know? I mean, we could have been people starving in, in Somalia or in Sudan. Uh, we could have been uh, so disabled that no, we can't do anything. There are so many things that could prevent us from achieving. And so we shouldn't become arrogant about that. We should realize that this is because of the grace of God. And so we need to keep that in, in context that way. Um, as Muslims also were taught to be uh, people of the middle path, to avoid and work against all bad things.